We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online, and then we have in-person services on our campus at nine and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. Thanks, Dale. Good morning, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. I also want to welcome those of you joining us online. Uh, yesterday morning was uh, our last moment to decide whether we were going to stay outside or go inside, and so the weather forecast predicted gale force winds for right now. It's a beautiful day. No gale force winds. First time in my 30-plus years here in Southern California where the weather forecast has been off, but we are... <laughs> We're glad uh, to see you both inside, those of you watching outside, those of you joining us online. Uh, we're just excited to be, be able to gather together today. Well, Valentine's Day is one of those Christian days on our calendar, like Christmas and Easter. But unlike Christmas and Easter, very few people know the story that's behind this day. St. Valentine of Rome was a Christian who lived in the third century when it was illegal to be a Christian. It was illegal to even help or assist Christians who were in need. But in spite of tremendous persecution, he continued to help his fellow Christians and to boldly tell others about the love of Jesus Christ. Finally, Valentine was arrested and sent to the emperor, Claudius. He told the emperor about the love of Christ, as was his practice to tell everyone. The emperor, of course, commanded Valentine to renounce his faith in Christ, or he would be beaten with clubs and then beheaded. Valentine refused to deny Christ, and he was executed on February 14, 269 AD. Now, it's very fuzzy. It's not clear at all how we got from this story, this true story, all the way to Cupid and chocolates and flowers and the celebration of romantic love. There's all kinds of theories, but nothing really clear how we got from that point to this point. But what is clear is that the celebration of this day, what got it started was when a follower of Jesus Christ was willing to die rather than be silenced about the love of Christ. So on this, the anniversary of his death, 1,752 years ago, I want to offer all of us today a Valentine gift in the form of a Valentine's prayer. It's a prayer written by the Apostle Paul, who, like Valentine, just a hundred and some years before him, also died in Rome for the same reason that Valentine did. This is the prayer written by the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians in the New Testament, chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Paul says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is one of my favorite prayers in the New Testament, a prayer that I go back to regularly. And on this day when we celebrate love in our culture, I wanted to look past the flowers and the cards, which is all fine and good, but I want to look past that this morning and consider what the author of love, what God himself says about this topic of love. Now, in this prayer, we find three important truths about the nature of love. We're going to look at these three. The truth, number one, the first truth is love requires a foundation, not a feeling. Love requires a foundation, not a feeling. We think, of course, that the essential requirement for love is a feeling. And if the feeling was there and now it goes, we really begin to wonder if we, as we say, have fallen out of love because the passion, the feeling is gone. But the truth is, love is more about the need for a foundation than it is about the need for a feeling. And because we have focused so much on the feelings of love, the passions of love, love tends to be very unstable in our modern culture. But what Paul says at the beginning of this prayer is he says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love. He's speaking of a foundation to love. When we love someone, we are pretty much only aware of the relationship between us and the person that we love. But there is a hidden relationship that forms 
the basis or the foundation that every relationship really stands on or doesn't stand on. And that is our relationship with God. He's the invisible relationship that's behind every visible relationship. Now, our relationship with God, of course, is a separate relationship, but it's not isolated from every relationship we have. It's connected. There's a link between our relationship with God and our relationship with others. And that link is like a root or a foundation. Paul describes it as a root here. A root, of course, is something that you can't see. It's below the surface of the ground. But everything above the surface, all of the visible flowers or fruit that grows on a tree or a bush, they owe their existence, of course, to the nutrients that come through the root that nobody can see. So when we think of love, we tend to think mostly of the flower of love or the fruit of love, the the things above the surface. We think of the deeds of love or the words of love or the feelings of love or the expressions of love. And what we tend to not realize is that those displays of love will only last if they're attached to a root. If they aren't, then they tend to have the shelf life of cut flowers. God is the author of love. And therefore, he is the soil in which real love grows. Now, if someone doesn't love God, or they don't even believe in God, which is not uncommon in our day, that doesn't mean they are incapable of loving anyone. No, they can still love people. For the same reason, a cut flower is still beautiful. Love can still exist in isolation or separation from God. But what is true is the capacity to love in that case, is limited by the capacity that that individual personally has for love. They have no greater resources to love beyond their own limits, their own capacity. But when someone is rooted in God's love, they are capable of going beyond the natural limits or capacity of their own love because they are tapping into the capacity, the resources of God to love. So how do we plant our lives? in the soil of God's love for us. This prayer that I'm focusing on actually began two verses earlier. This is what Paul says in the two verses that precede the the primary verses we're looking at. Verses 16 and 17, he starts out by saying, I pray that out of his glorious riches, God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Dwell in your hearts through faith. Everybody knows that love comes from the heart. Not the beating organ, of course, but the center of who we are. That's why the chocolates are in the shape of hearts and the candies are in the shape of hearts. We, we know that's where love comes from. It takes place in the heart. What we tend not to realize, what most don't realize, is that the heart is like an open space that must be filled. In the beginning, the heart of the first man and the first woman was filled with God's love for them. But then they decided that God's love was not enough. And they went off in search of more than God offered. And in doing so, they expelled God out of their hearts and that of all of their descendants. This effect has been to every human since then. So now the human heart is not empty Because the human heart cannot be empty. But now the human heart tends to be cluttered and filled up with every God replacement that you can imagine. It's amazing over the centuries and millennia what humans have been able to place inside their hearts and what they have been able to love instead of God. In the place of God, we've stuffed experiences, adventures, and things, objects, and money, and even other people. Now, these are all good things, and they're right, but when we try to use them to fill up our heart, it only clutters up our heart. And this has damaged our ability to love, because without God's love filling our hearts, we need love. And therefore, our ability to give love is limited. This makes our love dependent on how well we are loved. But God displayed his love for us. In spite of us trying to replace him with everything else, he displayed his love for us by sending his son, Jesus Christ, 
the Son of God took on a body, came to earth, he died for us, and established his love once again in our hearts, made that available to us. So how does this take place? How does the love of Jesus Christ then begin to take root in a heart? Well, it's a, it's a two-step process. There's two parts to it. They're mentioned in this prayer. First, the first thing that needs to happen is God needs to strengthen us with power through His Spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. What, what this is speaking of is God, through His power, He clears out a space in our hearts where there's room for Him. See, we keep throwing stuff into our hearts, trying to fill it up. So on our own, we will almost never see our need for God, let alone create the necessary space in our life for a relationship with Him. We'll just keep cluttering things up inside. So God uses His power both to open our eyes and oftentimes to create the circumstances to make room in our cluttered heart for Jesus to enter. Now, we most often experience this new space, this new hole in our hearts as a loss. Because in order to make space, something needs to be removed. And often what God does in life is he begins to take some things away to begin to create this space. And it usually hurts whenever God begins to remove stuff from our life that should be where only he belongs. But once that space is created... That brings us to the second part of restoring our relationship with God. We then decide to accept the love of Christ for us and invite Him into our hearts. He creates the space, and we invite Him into our hearts. Now, notice the word may in this prayer. May means it doesn't automatic. Just because God opens up a space that allows us to see our need for Jesus doesn't mean that we'll accept him and invite him in. Sometimes people who have had space opened in their hearts, in their pain, they just simply scramble for the next relationship or the next thing. And the window of opportunity to invite Jesus into their hearts closes again because they're cluttered up. We can always reach out for something else. We don't have to reach out for Jesus. But if we do accept God's love for us in Jesus Christ, His love begins to take root in our hearts. Now, to be clear, our life is usually still pretty cluttered. In fact, our hearts are going to always have some stuff in there that shouldn't be in there until the day we see Jesus Christ face to face. face. But, but now, even though our heart still has some junk in it, there's something brand new. There's a root, the love of God displayed for us in Christ, is beginning to grow in our hearts. We are now rooted in love. Not just in the feeling of love, not just in the idea of love, but in the actual, real, space and time love for us that God has. It's a real thing. So this is the first part of my Valentine's Day prayer for you today. I pray that you may be rooted and established in God's love for you in Jesus Christ. Truth number two, love is a dimension. It is not a deal. It's a dimension. It's not a deal. Let me explain what I mean by this. Our love has limits to it. Some of us are more patient than others, but we all eventually reach a point when we're done. The love deal is off. It's over. And usually it's because the pain and the wrong that's done to us by this individual is no longer worth it to us. It's time to move on. Now, in some cases, we're absolutely right. It is time to move on. If it's an abusive relationship, we need to move on. But since our love is a limited love, we tend to think God's love for us is also limited. We have this idea in our mind that we're all kind of on the edge, we're on probation with God, and if we mess up too many more times, 
then God's going to be done with us just like we would be done with someone like us. And so we maybe do the same sin for the 834th time, not that we're keeping count. And it's hard for us to imagine that God still loves us. I mean, if we were God, we would have given up on us a long time ago. We would have walked away from us, shaking our heads in disappointment. But the problem with that approach is we are taking the way we love and projecting it on the nature of God's love. And God's love is not limited like our love is. This is why in this prayer, Paul says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, that's where it begins, may have the power together with all the saints to grasp, and this is an amazing phrase, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. The dimensions of width and length and height and depth are used here to describe, to, to try to get a sense, to measure God's love for us. But something important is missing intentionally in these measurements. There are no numbers. There's, there's no metrics. There's just dimensions that are mentioned. It doesn't say, I want you to understand that God's love for you is 148 miles or kilometers wide. It's, it's 100 miles long. It's 10,000 feet high. It's just wide and long, and high, and deep. Why are there no metrics? Why no numbers? Well, a dimension has no limits. A dimension goes on for infinity. Width is width, height is height, depth is depth. And the point of this is that God's love for us has no end. We don't get to mile 103 and if we cross one more mile, it's, it's done. The deal's off. God's love keeps pursuing. If we've invited him into our hearts through Jesus Christ, he will not leave us. But because our love has limits to it, because our love is usually a series of deals or arrangements where you give me the love I want and I'll give you the love you want, because that's the kind of love that we are familiar with, it's so hard for us to grasp, as it says here. But Paul says, I, I pray that you would grasp this because you've never experienced anything like this. It's really hard for us to grasp and get a hold of something that is unusual in our experience. To grasp the width. Let's just look at these individually. Our love tends to be narrow, not wide. In other words, the kinds of people that we like, let alone love, is usually pretty narrow, not really wide. I mean, we might just say, well, you know, they're not my type, or I just don't click with that person. But that's not a category for God. God doesn't have the certain kind of people that he really likes and the other kind of people that he just really can't stand like humans tend to. Jesus was the example of God's love because he was God in flesh. And what was amazing to everyone during that time was the wide range of people that he loved. I mean, he would hang out with the, the moral bottom end of the culture. He was called a friend of sinners. And then culturally, he would hang out with this Samaritan woman, which was men didn't really initiate with women and show kindness. And they definitely, Jews didn't initiate with Samaritans. And so everything was just that Jesus did was just a continual shock. And it was just a small example of the love of God for us is wide. And it's long. You know, the lengths that we will go to to love someone has a limit to it, doesn't it? It's almost like there's a timer. Once the buzzer goes off, we're done pursuing this relationship. But God is so patient with us. There is no countdown in his head. 
He pursues us. And it's high and deep. You know, our love is attached to the ups, not as much to the downs. I mean, we understand that relationships go up and down, and so we'll take some down. But eventually, if a relationship is pretty much all downside and no upside, we have a limit. We're done. The deal's off. But for God, it's not like that. I mean, just think about it. We represent almost all downside and very little upside for God in a relationship. I mean, just think of what God did to love us. Think of what Jesus Christ did. He took on a body. He descended to earth. He endured ridicule. And then one of the most cruel deaths that humankind has ever invented on a cross. And he did all that because of love. That's the depth and the height of God's love for us. So you have to understand, we are not a good deal for God. If you at any point in time are thinking, I'm a pretty good deal, you are misperceiving yourself. You're great, but you're not a good deal. I'm not a good deal. We are far more cost than benefit. But the love of Christ is high and deep. If you and I were a deal, God would have walked away from us a long time ago. But his love knows no limits for us. So the question is, how can we grasp this? Well, Paul says, here's the problem. It surpasses knowledge. We, we literally lack the experience and the capacity, mental capacity, to fully grasp how much God really loves us in Christ. So how can we at least make progress in grasping this? You can't learn it about reading about it because it's like dimensions. You can read about dimensions, but you don't learn about dimensions until you experience dimensions. So the way we experience the love of Christ, Paul says in this prayer, is together with all the saints. Now in the Bible, a saint is not one of those few Christians, like St. Valentine, who have done two miracles. I mean, the man-made standard for being a saint is to perform two verified miracles. That's a man-made standard. In the Bible, a saint is described as everyone who has decided to follow Jesus Christ. We're all saints. If you've decided to follow Jesus Christ, you're a saint. Now, I wouldn't recommend you go around telling people that. <laughs> but by the definition of the Bible, you're a saint. We're all saints. So we grasp this love that God has for us together with all the saints. Where do all the saints gather? In the church. One of the amazing things about the church is that that's where you get to see the love of God in reality. That's where the love of God takes on a face. It's where his love becomes real to us. It's in the church where we get a chance to see and experience the width of God's love, for example. You know, in a church like this, you're going to find people that you would not love. People that you maybe not find in your neighborhood, but people that God loves as much as he loves you. And then in moments when you maybe don't feel worthy of God's love, you will hear stories of someone else who doesn't feel worthy of God's love and has experienced God's love, and you'll begin to experience how much God loves you. And if you stick around a church like this, and most churches long enough, you will see God transform people that you would have given up a long time ago. And when you're ready to give up on yourself, knowing some other people that you've had thoughts about before, I can't believe they recovered from that or are able to do this, that gives you hope that maybe you haven't gone beyond the limits of God's love for you. Sitting in a room all by yourself, reading the Bible is really helpful but it's not enough for you to grasp 
how much God loves you. That occurs together with all the saints. So the second part of my prayer for you this morning is this. I pray. I pray that you would grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ for you. Truth number three about love. Love is a void to fill, not a verdict to declare. Love is a void to fill, not a verdict to declare. Now, Valentine's Day is all about declaring love, right? I love you. I told my wife that this morning. Happy Valentine's Day. I love you. That's a good thing. I declared my love to her. Hopefully, you'll do that today, and hopefully someone will declare their love for you today. But declaring love, as great as that is, is not enough for us. I'll never forget March 16th, 1985. That's the day that I got married to my wife. That's the day that my wife publicly stated that she would love me until death parted us. I was on cloud nine. You know, most, most grooms are. Most grooms are like, I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> All of the doubts that I had about myself melted away on that day because she loved me. And she said so in front of a bunch of people. So was that the end of every question I've ever had about myself? No. No. I thought it would be, but it wasn't. Have I spent every day of the past 35 plus years confident in the knowledge that I'm loved? No, I haven't. Why not? Well, we've had a great marriage, but like every marriage, we have struggled to love each other well. And even on our best days, I have still walked out into the world, looking for the approval of as many people as I can get. The love of my wife has just declared her love for me, and I walk out of the world, and for some reason, that's not enough. I would prefer you to like me too, and you to like me too. It's just amazing how big this vacuum, this void of love really is. See, I'm still looking, and you're still looking for a verdict on the question of love. Am I loved? Everybody has that question still hanging in their head. See, a verdict, it's a legal term. It's it's a final statement of truth, of judgment on a matter. If all I needed was a verdict on whether I'm loved or not, then marriage would be the answer. And marriage would be the answer for everyone. And honestly, people who are not married tend to think that's going to be the answer. And no matter how much those of us who are married tell them it's not, <laughs> those who are not married just think, well, then you must have married the wrong person. I'm not going to make that mistake. I'm going to marry someone that actually loves me. I'm sorry you got stuck with someone that doesn't. But you see, marriage doesn't answer that love question because love is a void that must be continually filled. It's not a verdict that can be stated stated and put to bed forever and put to rest forever. No, it's got to be filled. We can never hear enough statements to settle the question of love in our hearts. But we really try one day a year, this day. And on this one day... In our nation, we will pour 36 million boxes of heart-shaped chocolates and 250 million roses and a total of an estimated $21.9 billion into the love void. Now, I'm not saying take those chocolates back and (laughs) you can't return the flowers. No, that's fine. That's good. But just don't think that that's going to answer the real question that any of us have. It doesn't. So you put $21.9 billion into the love void, and still, every single person is going to wake up on Monday morning still needing more love. 
Why? Well, the Bible tells us that we were created in the image of God. Part of what that means is our self-image, how we view ourself, the image we have of ourself, is forever attached to what God thinks of us. So what that means is there are not enough I love yous in this world to replace his I love you. His I love you is the one that fits inside our hearts. It's only as we grasp the love of Christ that we are, as Paul says, filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I mean, imagine your heart as a container with measurements written on the side like a lot of cooking containers have. You know, half, three quarters, full. If your heart reads, all the fullness of God, what's next? Overflow. You're now able to love other people more fully because your love for each other isn't embedded with this big question of whether or not they love you. Now, you would probably still prefer their love, but you don't need their love because your heart's already full. That means that you don't need a deal. You're free to love. You don't need a deal in exchange to love. You're free to love. A few weeks ago, out here on the um, courtyard, I was talking with some people, and all of a sudden I felt something on my leg, and I looked down, and here was a, a little child about this tall had latched on to my leg. And it wasn't one of my grandkids. So I thought, this will be interesting. <laughs> so I didn't do anything. I just kind of stood there, and the child kept kind of grabbing on for a little while. And eventually, the child looked up, I know, thinking that they would see the face of their father, and they saw me. <laughs> I didn't do anything, but it freaked the child out <laughs> when they noticed I wasn't dad. Now, why would a child do this? Well, it's the result of the natural attachment between a parent and a child. So the child had wandered away from the parent and was looking for the parent and saw a pair of legs <laughs> and grabbed a hold. Now, we do much the same thing on a soul level. We're designed for attachment to God. He is our Heavenly Father. But we've all run away from home. Now, we've run in different directions and at different distances. But we cannot run away from the attachment we are created to have with God. We can't run away from the need for home in our hearts. So now we find ourselves reaching out for and grabbing hold of all kinds of strange things. Thinking, maybe that's our Heavenly Father. We form God-level attachments to all kinds of things. Now, occasionally, we look up and we discover what we're holding on to is the wrong thing, and we let go. Now, the reason this child grabbed onto my leg was because there was some similarity between me and their father. You know, the child didn't just go grab a hold of a tree thinking that was dad, or another child thinking that was dad. No, there had to be some resemblance. And this is the same reason our soul reaches onto and grabs a hold of the things that it does. We don't just grab a hold of anything. We grab a hold of something that reminds us of our Heavenly Father, even if we don't know it. And the closest resemblance that we can often find is the love of other people. Because, well, they're made in the image of God. It's about as close as it gets to God. And so we grab onto their love in desperation. But their love is never enough. Because that's not the love that we really at a heart level, are created to grab a hold of. 
No person, no matter how well they love, can ever settle the am I loved question. That's because there's a hole in our hearts that can only be filled with the love of God. It doesn't matter whether with you agree with this or not. This is true of us. We will experience it. And that hole can only be filled when we accept the mercy of Christ that forgives and removes the sin that is cluttering up our hearts and preventing us from receiving God's love. Now, I hope on this Valentine's Day, you have a great Valentine's Day. I hope that you're loved well today. But again, I promise you it won't be enough. Only the love of Christ can fill you to all the measure of the fullness of God. So, let me pray for us now. And I'm going to be praying this prayer for you this week. So let's pray. Father, on this day that we celebrate love, we turn to you, we look up to you, the author of love. And we thank you for your great love displayed to us, not in how well the circumstances of our life or our week are going, but displayed in the tremendous gift and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's where we see and that's where we experience the full measure, unlimited measure of your love for us. And so for everyone listening today, I pray these three things. I pray, first of all, that they would be rooted and established in the love of God found in Jesus Christ. And if they are not, Father, I pray that you would create space in their hearts, a hole in their hearts to make room for you. And then I pray that you would grant them the power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is your love for them. I pray for those who feel like they are unworthy of your love, that they've messed up so much that they could never be loved. God, I pray that you would counter that lie with the truth and that they would grasp how much you love them. And then, Father, I pray, finally, that they may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, that they may know what it's like to grab a hold of you and not all of the things that they thought might be you. And you would fill them to all the measure of your fullness so that they might then be able to love without condition. I pray that you'd give us the courage of St. Valentine to represent your love in this world. We ask this now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.